Absolutely. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm Mark Kiprin with uh, with Verge Technologies. We're excited to have Kerwood and, and Ron on today from Corning um, in in what I think is something that's an, an advance in, in the cabling space that maybe we haven't seen in some time. Um, there's a lot of cool technologies that we all work with, but um, I found in the projects we've worked on, other than maybe the type of cable we're using, um, things aren't being done that differently. And, and the guys from Corning are going to show us some ways that now they are. And, uh, and a lot of the gains and the value that the, that the clients are seeing come out, come out of that. Before we do hand it over, I'm going to just quickly run through uh, a little introduction on Verge. So Verge Technologies uh, is, was previously the, the technology division of this care communications it became its own entity uh, early this year as part of a management buyout. Uh, we've, we've added some great new team members as part of the part of the move. Uh, we've we've held on to a lot of great team members as well. So our management team, our ownership team was previously the management team and continues to be our management and leadership team. Uh, all of our great technicians are are still with us. Our sales and operation team. Uh, is improving all the time, uh, so we're excited about the move, and uh, and and we're finding it easier to uh, to support our clients on all the services that we have in the past, and and it actually being able to kind of narrow down, zero in our, our focus on where we really want to play and what partners we we'd like to work with, uh, so we can better we can better propose solutions using using those those key partners. Continue uh, with our strengths in. in Professional AV and and kind of the cabling part, the structured cabling part, uh, as well as security and and light safety systems. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, we're looking forward to continuing business and 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 improving the way we do it. Uh, the Spotlight series was was designed as a way for us to meet with our clients and and hopefully continue to bring some value with them in a time when meeting face to face wasn't really permitted. So that's that's how the series was was uh, came came to be. The con that's where the concept came from, and uh, we're excited for today's session. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unshare, um, and I'm going to let let Kerwood Dubois take over, and he's also going to introduce Perfect. Ron Wells. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Actually, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kerwood Dubois, so I am uh, the Corning uh, Sales Engineer for Eastern Canada. So if you do have any questions after the meeting, you can uh, contact anyone at Verge that will be able to provide you with my contact information. And they, uh, we can do a conference call and go through your needs. And if any of the sales guys at Verge have any questions, you can call me directly. So today, uh, today's session, like uh, Mark mentioned, we're going to be going uh, over what we call our Corning SD-LAN platform. So this is a new way of uh, converging fiber and uh, power to the edge, where we can bring actually, the advantage actually for this solution is to bring uh, bandwidth and power to the edge of the network. We have a lot more people that are asking for PoE devices and that have PoE devices that are plugged at far distance, further distances. So uh, our solution will allow them to actually plug those devices with uh, data and power. And also uh, one of, uh, very important thing for all uh, network administrators is basically the, um, basically the end user experience. So we wanna make sure that the, our solution uh, provides the best end user experience as possible. So uh, with single mode fiber, so there is unlimited bandwidth. So whatever uh, applications they'll need for the future, at least they'll need to, they'll cable it only once. And then after that, they can add whatever device they need for the future run. And we also have a power application that will bring uh, DC power for their PoE devices. So uh, without, uh, any further ado, I will present to you uh, Ron Wells. Ron Wells is one of our uh, lead uh, engineers, actually, on that solution. So Ron will go over the solution with you. And if you have any questions throughout the solution, you can stop us at any time and ask questions. And we'll be more than happy to help you and answer those questions. So Ron, I will leave it over to you. For the best, Ron's got a pretty, uh, pretty cool studio. So for the best viewing experience we've found, uh, is we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you to pin pin Ron. So if you go to the taskbar, the team's taskbar, over to the right, 
right beside the hang up button. Don't press that one. If the show participants, you click show participants, you'll see Ron Wells name in the list. And if you press the three dots to the right, you can choose to pin Ron. We ask you if you if you choose if you can pin Ron, you can then click on um, anywhere on the screen and the participants will go away or you can close it down. Um, and then uh, Ron's Ron's presentation will will take place on his screen. Ready when you are, Ron. OK, thanks. So can everybody hear me OK and see the screen OK? Yep. All right. OK, so um, just to take off where uh, Kurt was talking, uh, my name is Ron Wells. I'm from the Iowa area um, and currently live in the Kansas City area, but all of my relatives are actually from the Brantford Woodstock area up in Canada. So I used to go up to Canada all the time. Uh, so it's kind of fun to have these uh, these presentations with the Canadian team. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a couple things here. One is going to be our software defined LAN technology. Uh, I'll take you through a case study. So we've got a little video we're going to show, and I'll show you the numbers behind it, the design, you know, what what we ended up doing, those kinds of things. So you can see, you know, the differences of doing what we call a fiber power deep design versus a traditional copper switch network design. Okay, and then we'll wrap up with a light version of this that we call a touchless network uh, that's using just uh, a subset of these components to create a very strong, you know, long reach solution for like security cameras and things like that that are used outdoors. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started here. I'm just going to show a couple slides. So let me kick over. Okay, can you guys all see the screen? Okay, still. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So uh, a couple things, really. One one mindset that Corning has, it's a little bit different than maybe what, what you see on more of that traditional copper switch side, once again, is we want to think about that horizontal run in the network as becoming that fourth utility. Okay, So instead of having a, you know, a cabling infrastructure that's put in and ripped and replaced every you know, three to five years, what we want to think about is, you know, as you design these buildings and, and these upgrades, we want you to think about the same way you think about your MEP or your mechanical electrical plumbing types of infrastructure. So, you know, 25 year, 50 year type of mindset. We know that if you take fiber, uh, it's got a long life to it. And so it really comes down to a couple of things. One is how many strands of fiber you need to each area. And the other is how much copper do you need to, to push the power to support those devices. So what we're going to do is basically ask you to kind of forget about all the rules of network design as it relates to things like 100 meter distance limitations and other things like that. And just kind of look at if we were to break all those rules and start over, what would the, what would a network look like? OK, there's also a couple other drivers and I'm not going to talk about every box here. But there's a couple new drivers that have really come in, you know, over the past, I'd say, two, three, five years. Um, and some of them are just now happening, like 5G, a millimeter wave and, you know, the entire uh, six gigahertz and under spectrum on the cellular side and how that's being pushed to digital and even to uh, Ethernet based systems, small cells and things like that. Uh, you've got Wi-Fi 6 and technologies that follow after that that need more and more bandwidth. Um, and then there's the overall software defined architectures that we're seeing across the board. Um, a lot of what we're going to be touching on comes out of the data center world, um, but we're applying some new things to it. But whether you're talking about smart buildings, the Internet of Things, all the different social media platforms, uh, live streaming like what we're doing right now, all these things are really starting to you know, redefine what's a network need to support, not just today, but in the future. Okay. So if you look at what Corning's done, we've really taken technology out of three different areas. It's the enterprise land space first and foremost, but it's also the data center and the fiber to the home world. OK, and what we've done is we've looked at, well, what could what would you do differently if you had the reach of fiber and using commercial off the shelf electronics? What you know, what happens to your cost structure there at layer two, especially? And then other things that come into play, like the cable diameter and the pull strength and being able to put power inside the same jacket. All these things really will mix in and create a different type of economic view of what a network looks like at layer one, at layer two. OK, and it's going to impact things like the labor. It'll impact your space, your HVAC, 
um, you know, the, the cooling requirements uh, that are in the IDF closets, you know, how much copper you're really putting out in the network, and just for that matter, how much cable you're having to install to support all those devices. And, and not only that, but when you think about how a lot of networks are designed today, you're, you're really looking at a separate cable for every device on the floor of a building. And as you add more and more devices, as be, buildings become more and more smart, you end up with more and more cables. And at some point in time, uh, which I think we're now crossing over that, uh, it's just really difficult to add more and more cable to, you know, to these buildings. So what we've done is we've really looked at how can you simplify a network? When, you know, when I give tours of the different networks that we've deployed uh, for customers, I kind of have to prepare them ahead of time to say, prepare to be underwhelmed because they're used to seeing stacks and stacks of distribution switches or work group switches throughout the building. They're used to seeing, you know, a lot of electronics um, in the middle of the network. And what you'll see is as we, as we, uh, you know, walk through a couple of these sites, these networks are very simple. There's fewer boxes required in order to run them. Uh, and there's a whole lot less cable as well, okay? So there's a couple components here we're gonna jump on today. Um, but just so you understand the overall ecosystem that Corning plays in, uh, we wanna be able to support all of those end user experiences, whether it's Wi-Fi, point of sale, voice over IP, IPTV, all those. There's probably 20, 30 different networks that um, the master format specs call out in terms of you know the construction documents and, and how all those different um, divisions are laid out. Uh, so I'm specifically talking about like division 27, a little bit in 26 on the power side and on 28 when you get into safe security. Uh, but all those different networks then can be supported by this in-building network platform. And we really break it down into three areas and I'm gonna touch on two of them. So there's cellular solutions or small cells. Uh, there's the land side of things or the software defined networking and then there's powering solutions. So we're really going to camp out on the land solutions and powering solutions today. And I'll just start by saying the cabling infrastructure that Corning uses for these new networks, there is no new training really required. It's the exact same equipment we've been using for years. It's a CCH chassis, it's the fiber splice cassettes, it's things like that. The only thing that's different is we also now manage some copper inside of our CCH pad, uh, chassis. So, um, and I'll get into that and what it looks like here in a little bit. But uh, it's a widely used, you know, across North America. Um, and there's really no new training that's required in terms of install and configuration and things like that. All we're doing is we're taking equipment that we used to put in the MDF and the data center, we're moving it now to the IDF. So for years, we've had fiber up the riser. Now we're going to push fiber and copper combined out the horizontal. Okay. So real quick on the cable itself, uh, for those that haven't seen this type of cable before, basically it's a, uh, inside the same jacket is both single mode fiber and copper conductors. And there's a lot of different flavors and that's where Kerwood will be able to help you out. Uh, so we have one to 24 single mode fibers, two to 12 copper conductors, 20 gauge to 12 gauge. So it's 20, 18, 16, 14 and 12 gauge. Okay, and then for us, when it comes to the equations that we have to solve for how much power you need and how far you need to go, we have some calculators we use to just determine well, what gauge wire should we put inside of this cable to support that application. Okay, so you can kind of see um, on my screen here some of the distances. The main takeaway is we can go way over, um, you know, that 300 foot or 100 meter distance limitation. Uh, and it's, you know, to go 2,000 feet even is, is uh, very doable, even at the higher power levels, okay? The other thing too, and this, uh, this actually came to, to me here about, I don't know, five or six months ago, as I was working with some consultants on the West Coast, and they came back and said that we think we can justify the entire cost of the network just based on the savings in conduit alone. And that was kind of surprising to me. Coin obviously doesn't make conduit, but um, in my previous life, I, uh, I was a double E and used to do, you know, conduit fill calcs or, you know, things like that. The, and I, I, I'm looking at conduit here, but this could just as easily be, you know, cable tray, wire basket, you know, whatever. But it's that that's that support um, infrastructure that, you know, is used for the cable itself. Here, here's what we found out. I found the smallest CAT 6A that was rated 10 gig 
um, that I could find in the industry, and that's a dot two five inch diameter. And I compared it to a two by two Actify cable, the cable we just showed you before. So that's two sigma fiber, two copper conductors, and that's a dot two inch diameter. And then we just looked at what does this do to change conduit or cable tray, things like that, in terms of the fill. Here's what we found out. Just cable to cable, there's about a 20% savings. You drop about a trade size on, on conduit, okay? If you factor in though, and I'll show you here in just a little bit, the um, what we call our access nodes. So you can have one cable feeding three, four, or eight ports, RJ45 ports. Then suddenly that port multiplier effect kicks in and we're now seeing drops of, you know, maybe like three, four, even five or six trade sizes. So where you would have used a four inch conduit, you're now maybe using a one inch conduit or something like that. Uh, so there's a uh, there's a significant savings on that piece. So once again, it's not something corning uh, sells. We don't sell conduit, but it's something that as we really condense or, uh, you know, combine all these networks together, um, we're seeing a lot of benefits on this side too. And it, it plays out in two areas. One is obviously in greenfield builds where it's a brand new building, but the other is in if you're just upgrading an existing building or existing network, it's a lot easier to push this kind of cable all over the, the building than it would be to go with a traditional approach. So let me talk a little bit about the building blocks. Because um, in, in general, it's a, it's a very simple network uh, and it, there's just a few components to, to make everything up. So what we have here is a what we call a software defined network. OK, and, and in general, it comes in two pieces. There's the control plane and the data plane. And think about it this way, the data plane for the most part here, you'll see we take that out of the data center world. So these are data center um, SFP plus or 10 gig bare metal switches. And we've built a orchestration platform that is optimized for the enterprise environment. So we're running a network operating system on top of a data center class switch. So the switch itself, in fact, it's this box right here. We call it our software defined data plane. It's a 10 gig or SFP plus or one or 10 gig 48 port. It also has six QSFP plus or uh, 40 gig ports. Okay. And it's a, uh, it, it, you know, in terms of its performance, uh, it's got like a 1.44 terabit per second backplane. It's it's um, really over designed for how we use it today. Uh, but because it comes out of the hyperscale data center world, the cost of these types of boxes are very, very favorable. OK, so that's probably the basic building block of what you'll see in the MDF. Um, and that's for point to point active Ethernet. So a port on that box will map out to an edge um, access node that I'll talk about here in a second. So that's active Ethernet. We also support GPON in the same system. In fact, you could have a building that has both active Ethernet and GPON at the same time. What GPON is, is basically it's a point to multi-point. So you take one port called an OLT or optical line terminal port, and you can go through a one by 32 optical splitter, passive device about, uh, I don't know, maybe like the deck of us, um, deck of playing cards kind of size. And uh, that device then can feed up to 32 of these access nodes. Okay, so it's 2.4 gig down and 1.2 gig up. Well, that's GPON, okay, point to multi-point. And then the server itself, um, once again, that's borrowed from the uh, data center side. It's a hardened server runs what we call an orchestration platform. So this this is the software that basically programs the switches, um, whether it's the software defined data plane or the software defined optical line terminal to communicate to the edge of the network. And the edge of the network is where we use what are called access nodes or software defined access nodes. And they come in a lot of different flavors. The one on bottom we use quite a bit. It's an indoor outdoor temperature range. So it goes down to like negative 40 degrees um, Fahrenheit uh, up to 140 degrees. Um, and Kurt, would you probably help translate into Celsius for me there? <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not we'll, as good we'll, at <laughs> We'll do, that's fine. Thanks. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we have a, like that's a three port device. So it's 30 watts of PoE power composite against two ports. And then there's a third port that's non PoE. Okay. Uh, there is also a four port version, which is the box above. That's 60 watts of PoE across four giggy ports. 
And then we have a, a um, an eight port version that's up to 140 watts of PoE if we local power it. And then there's another one that is a new one that's a five port. So it looks just like the four port, but it has a fifth port with a blue border around it. And that's for M gig. So it does 2.5 or five gig, or it can do all the way up to 10 gig. So to get 10 gig at that level, all we do is take one of the transceivers out of the software defined data plane, because it's SFP plus, we can take out a one gig transceiver and put in 10 gig transceiver. So it's real straightforward in terms of how we upgrade to the 10 gig level. And I'll just kind of mention in passing too on the PON side, for those that are familiar with the PON technology, the next version of the technology uh, is based called XGS PON. And that's a symmetrical 10 gig uh, instead of a 2.4 and 1.2 gig port. And that transceiver uh, or that box basically gets replaced by a transceiver. So one transceiver goes into that software defined data plane and that becomes the OLT port. That's the symmetrical 10 gig. So you kind of think of it this way in a way like capacity wise, those four ports there uh, in terms of OLTs um, ports are uh, in terms of if you add up all the bandwidth, so 2.4 times 4 versus a 10 gig symmetrical, that whole box is being replaced by one transceiver that goes inside that 48 port switch. Okay, And then that would then feed that 10 gig um, access node that I talked about earlier. But the, that's really the, the basic building blocks of the network. You have the control plane, which is a server and orchestration platform, and then the data plane that's made up of the boxes you put in the head end and the MDF, and then the, uh, the boxes at the edge. We use um, IDFs for really just two things, fiber management and power injection. So we do not have a bunch of switches typically in our designs uh, for um, you know, the middle of the network. Now that said, we also support though, we do have a 24 and 48 port uh, PoE switch. So we can feed Cat5 or Cat6 cables um, you know, out to the edge of the network as well. Okay, so if there is part of a network that just needs to be upgraded and you want to continue to use the, uh, you know, the Cat5 or Cat6 cable, then we're able to also pick up that side of the network as well using those PoE switches. Okay. Power side. Um, <clears throat> so for, uh, for powering these devices, this is following uh, what we call a, a, a limited power supply approach. So there's a couple parameters that we, we look at to fit within that code. One is uh, less than 60 volts DC, and the other is, is that it has to be less than 100 volt amps or 100 watts. So this box delivers 12 100 watt circuits out to the, uh, the access nodes. Okay, so this is how we power that pair of copper for all those devices. And it's very straightforward. It's just uh, you patch these in to the CCH panel that I'll show you here in a little bit. And that's how we provide power out to the edge of the network. So let me kind of summarize here. When I talked about the utility, so it's fiber from the MDF, fiber trunk from the MDF to the IDF, and it's composite fiber from the IDF out to the edge of the network. We're adding injecting power at the IDF and then we're feeding fiber fed devices. So usually it's an access node, like what I showed you, but there are some boxes that can take fiber directly. Like there's a Crestron box I'll show you um, here in just a little bit in the, uh, in the video coming up that Corning used, uh, where we just put a transceiver directly into that SFP cage that the, uh, that the Crestron box has, and we just go directly uh, fiber into that device. And I think over time, you're going to see that more and more. Uh, you already see that with some outdoor uh, Wi-Fi APs. You see that with some outdoor security cameras um, and in Crestron boxes and things like that on the AV side. We're expecting to see that happen more and more, especially uh, indoors as the bandwidth requirements go higher and higher. And then once you have those ports at the edge of the network, you're going to plug in all those other devices, right? So your VoIP phones, your security cameras, uh, your AV, you know, your Wi-Fi APs, all those other devices can be then fed from the edge of the network. Okay. So what's different and what's the same? Th think about it this way. If you took a, uh, a construction set of drawings and put them out on the table, 
and it had locations for all your Wi-Fi AP security cameras, AV boxes, everything. It's going to look exactly the same. What's different is instead of running a Cat5 or a Cat6 cable back from every device back to the IDF, we're now just running a cable to the zone or to the device. So think about it this way. It's almost like a stereo dial, okay? If we take our, our uh, access nodes and we put them all in the IDF closet, we still get 100 meters from the access node to the edge of the network. So if, if we put everything back in the IDF, this network would look exactly the same as a copper switch network, and that's dialed to zero, okay? Ryan. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, it's perfect. Can you just focus or zoom in a little bit? It's a little bit blurry. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, it's better. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, so if I if I dial this to zero and put all my access nodes in the IDF closet, it's it looks exactly the same as traditional copper switch network. If I dial it to ten, I have a fiber that goes to every device. So I may only be a, a one port ONT. We do have uh, that option as well. And in the future, if that device uh, is replaced by another one that does have an SFP cage where you can just hit it directly with the fiber, you'll throw away the ONT and you plug the fiber right into that device. So we do that sometimes for like Wi-Fi AP drops and, and other things like that. Um, but that's dialed to 10. Now you could dial it to maybe like a four to five and then that would be more like you're gonna put eight port ONTs in a uh, conference room and maybe four of those ports feeds wall jacks and the other four will pick up uh, a security camera a projector overhead and a wi-fi ap and maybe a small cell or something like that um, so you have like fiber to the zone maybe it's fiber to the room and you're using four port ont's but you can kind of see how with each network uh, with each uh, you know design you can dial this this platform, you know, up or down, depending upon the budget of the uh, the network, how future ready you want to be, all those different variables. So it's it's something that you know when you're doing designs, it's important to realize that, you know, if you do dial this all the way to ten, it, it will cost more, but in terms of being future ready, you'll be ready to go, right? Um, if you dial it all the way to zero, you're not going to be taking full advantage of what this platform could do. But it's, you know, with a copper switch network, you only get one volume setting. That's at zero, basically. So in the hands of an engineer, that's where they're able to go in and really dial this in. So let me give you an example. Like if this was a, uh, uh, I'll pick on a hotel. So you may want to do like GPON up the, uh, up the stack into all the rooms. So you'll be doing a, uh, uh, you know, an ONT behind each what we call media wall behind the TV sets, for example. Uh, you may want to do active Ethernet out to the Wi-Fi APs in the lobby. Uh, and then you may even want to drop a small switch, like a 24 port switch next to the exercise room to go pick up all those devices or exercise equipment inside of that, that area there. So you, you can use different types of networks depending upon what part of the building you're in. They all communicate back up to the orchestration platform. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's a hybrid type design. Okay, so I'm gonna quick jump over and I'm gonna show you what one of these looks like when we deploy it. Actually, before I jump in here, any questions so far? Does everybody uh, understand big picture what our software-defined network looks like? Ron, it's Mark. I'm just going to remind anyone that joined late. Um, if uh, best best way to see Ron's presentation, if you uh, just go on the participants in the taskbar, which is right next to the hang up button. If you press that button, you'll see. Pardon me. You'll see Ron Wells in the list. If you hit the three buttons next to him, you can. You can pin him, and that will put his his video and his presentation taking up kind of your, your full screen. Just as a reminder, in case you joined after we uh, we started, led with that. I don't see any questions in the chat or anything, Ron. So if you feel free to uh, forge ahead. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mark. I'm gonna quick kind of zoom out here just a little bit. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is we're going to uh, 
take a quick tour of Corning's new headquarters that we just deployed here and moved in probably about five or six months ago. So it's just a quick four minute video. This is out on YouTube if you want to find it there too. <clears throat> but this is a, uh, it's a 175,000 square foot building and we've got all of the different networks running over this uh, software defined network platform. Okay, so <clears throat> what you'll see is, uh, I think there's eight or nine racks in the MDF. We only use one IDF uh, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. But what we have is like the software defined data planes I talked about earlier. That's the switches that are have the green flashing light. So there's the 48 port SFP plus switches. And then we also have some GPON in the building. And so you'll see that's the OLT ports right there in those two boxes. Um, we do uh, the powering over the PSU, so the 12 100 watt circuits on that one U box. That's what those look like. This building does have cellular uh, for AT&T and Verizon, and they use our small cell spider cloud platform. So that's the controller for the cellular service. And then this is the uh, CCH chassis. I'm going to pause it right here just for a quick second so you can see. It's the same equipment we've been selling for years. Fiber management's on the left and copper management is on the right. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking those um, SDDP ports and we're running them through the CCH panels and we're taking the power side and running it through there. And in the back, we're taking copper pairs and single mode fiber, combining them together under the same jacket. And that cable then runs out across the building. So it's well over hundred meters in a lot of places, but distance is our friend when it comes to fiber so we're not we're not uh we're able to do that put it that way so this is like a small conference room so there's a crestron av box with fiber directly fed into it and then we've got a small ont up above it and that's feeding like the void phone and and some other things in the room there uh larger conference rooms we pick up things like digital displays and projectors and you know all those other types of devices as the camera kind of turns around, look in the upper left corner there, and you'll see the, the wire basket that we use for the cabling. That that probably could have been a J hook in that area right there, by the way. Um, it's We have a lot of room for growth when it comes to the cable tray system there. Uh, and so here's a, uh, here's a Wi-Fi AP. Uh, this is a very common type of drop that we would have. You'll see that little ONT that's up above it there on the left. So you got the little yellow cable that hits that. And then there's about a three, maybe four foot jumper that then comes down and hits that AP. So it's a very common type of drop. Uh, here's some access security cameras being fed off the same platform. Uh, in terms of office equipment, uh, you know, all those types of devices as well. Um, we do white noise or sound masking, uh, scheduling panels. Uh, this is the knock for the security. Uh, here's an eight port ONT. These are all plenum rated, so you can put them above the ceiling. And then you'll see those are feeding the scheduling panels on the to the conference rooms. Uh, those devices there, those ONTs are the small cells for AT&T and Verizon for uh, cellular service. Uh, there's a couple uh, cafeterias in the building. So we have uh, you know things like point of sale, uh, the menu boards. Uh, there's some digital displays that we have in some of the booths. Uh, where the employees can work. On the outside around the campus, we have a lot of security cameras. And what you'll see here is, like I'm going to pause it again just so we can kind of get a good eye here. Um, the switch itself, all of that's back in the building. And what we've done is we brought a fiber out to this enclosure and we're doing power injection from this point out to all of the cameras over that Actify cable, only because it's outside, it's now the Freedom cable that's indoor outdoor rated. Okay, so same CCH, uh, same power injection, those kinds of things. And then the ONT or the access node that you saw above by the uh, Wi-Fi AP, it's the uh, same one that's right here. It's got that indoor outdoor temperature rated chipset to it. And that's uh, just feeding then that access security camera that's up above. Okay, the orchestration platform then is how we interface into the network. And that's where we do all the configurations, set up all the security. It's a full blown, you know, layer two network solution. Okay. Uh, 
Thanks, Ron, for going through the video. I'll just take uh, one minute just to go over a few points here, Ron, if you don't mind. Sure, please. Okay, uh, just for everyone. So what's important about this solution, it's because uh, basically you can, uh, this solution, it's one cabling system that will allow you to have multiple services. Like you saw in the video, there was Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, cellular, security cameras, BMS, building management, AV. So you had all the services coming into one platform. The advantage of that platform is the orchestration software. Orchestration software will give you visibility to every single port on your uh, network. And also you can do over 4,000 VLANs in that orchestration platform. So uh, that's um, amazing because no, I don't think there's another service out there that allows you to do that many VLANs. In terms of security, a lot of people say, well, you know what, I'm gonna have different services. What about security? It's 128 bit encryption security. There's Mac authentication on that. And uh, it is totally secure. So uh, there is no concerns to have, depending on having multiple systems multiple services basically on that system. The system is built, like we said, from the ground up. So we didn't take something else to try building it. We built it from the ground up for enterprise solutions. So system is there. And uh, if you need another training after that on the orchestration platform, we can take time and go through the orchestration platform and we can go deep into the orchestration platform to show you exactly how much visibility you have and how much data you can get out of it. Okay, I just wanted to uh, take the time to go through this, Ron, so I'll leave it back to you. Okay, thanks, Kerwin. Good points. Um, so I'm going to show you the numbers that just back up what you saw on the video. And let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see a little better. I'm not going to read through all these, I promise. Uh, we had 1,920 ports, roughly. We had 402 access nodes, 159 security cameras, 156 Crestron boxes, 111 Wi-Fi APs, and I'll kind of move my head here and you can see these are all the different networks that we uh, we supported on the on the platform. OK. The the way we did our design and for a lot of like what we'll call the Fortune 500 type companies or healthcare, certain verticals, financial. Uh, you have to do you know what they call an HA or high available design where you have an A and a B side. So in our design then, um, if you were to like lose your top of rack, uh, the other side would pick up, your B side would pick up if your A dropped or you know, different things like that, okay? Uh, when we did that, we had to put some of that B side equipment in a physically separate room and that's why you see we did use one IDF closet in this particular example. But we, you know, what we did was we had, um, if you look the traditional copper, row is if we had done this the way that you know the industry has been doing for a long long time that's what it would have taken because we did this fiber deep approach some of these numbers changed pretty dramatically so we went from six idfs down to one idf we would have had a roughly 2300 cat 6a drops so that's a cable going from an idf out to a device 156 fiber drops and granted the the fiber drops did go up we went to 509 fiber drops from 156 because of the composite fiber. The big change though, is we got rid of about two thirds of the cable. Okay, so we went from about a quarter million feet of cable on CAT6 down to 82,000 feet of composite fiber. And remember, it's also a smaller diameter too. And that's because one cable can feed multiple ports in a zone, okay? And then if we had stayed with traditional design, let me move my head a little bit here. Uh, we would add a two foot wide wire basket going around. Instead, we used a 12 inch or one foot wide basket and you saw how full it was in some areas. Okay. And then on top of that, we ended up deploying 1900 ports roughly. The design initially called out for about 1400 ports. So we have some spare ports up in the ceiling that we can use for future growth as well. And then JCI is the company that did the install for us. They came back and calculated using their numbers, not ours, about a 29% savings in overall cost because they did the fiber deep approach compared to a traditional copper switch network. And if you look at it across the board, we've done enough of these and we've, we've kind of got some averages that we're seeing uh, pop up. 
small office buildings, you, you still have uh, similar electronics, but you don't get to spread it over as many square feet. So the savings isn't quite as much. In some cases, it may be more, but a lot of times it's just a little bit less. When you get into the medium and large office space, it's a pretty dramatic savings, uh, you know, somewhere in that 30% mark. When you get into campus environments and outdoor camera type deployments, it's almost a 50% savings. In fact, that's the outdoor cameras, and that's because distance is our friend when it comes to fiber, right? Um, the outdoor cameras though really came up. It wasn't something we were initially focused on, but we started to see a trend. And it's because the industry really has a gap in technology today. If you wanna solve for something that's 100 meters or less, then a traditional copper network is gonna be able to reach that. If you wanna go past that 100 meters, now you're having to use media converters and really expensive uh, systems, basically. You know, without calling out other OEMs, you know, what we're hearing on the street is anywhere from around eighteen to $2,000 a port up to $2,800 a port. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a much more costly way of solving those long distance runs. And so there's this gap in the industry. And what we found is, is that this is getting aggressively pushed into that area. So we thought we would, um, you know, highlight it and even, even push it a little bit more. So we created a special offer specifically for that kind of environment. And we simplified it as well. So we call, oh, yep. Sorry, it's Mark, sorry to interrupt. Can you, uh, if you just back that up one second, I think those savings are pretty impressive. I'm just uh, wondering if you can define it a little more for me. Is that like a labor and cable cost savings? Is that where those numbers are coming from, would you say? It's, yeah, it's all in. So it's, uh, it's material and labor combined. Yep. All right, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, let me just kind of remember the analogy I gave you too about the stereo dial. You can dial it to zero, you can dial it to 10. So kind of lay that dimension on top of this. Right? And what we're seeing like in office space though is right around that 30%. We're typically not doing a fiber to every device, but we are pushing fiber extremely deep in like enterprise uh, headquarters, things like that. Uh, in some hotels, especially if they're being built and the, you know, the owner or developer wants to flip them in the first year, you know, you might dial those to a two or three and you know really focus in on what's the most cost effective way to drop as many ports to the edge of the network as possible uh, you know and so but there's each of these types of environments the designers can use you know whatever is the best tool to get to whatever the need is from a, you know an sla perspective for that particular network so it's uh, there's uh, oh, go ahead Kerwin. But basically, uh, when you're done your presentation i have those number ventilated so mark if you want, right after Ron, I can go through all those numbers to, and then you can see exactly where the cost savings are. Perfect. Yeah, this is just a summary summary slide of an entirely different deck that, um, yeah, Kerwe can, can walk us through. So focusing on that outdoor camera side and those other types of devices, here's what we did. So if you remember with a... Um, software defined network, you have a control plane and the data plane. What we did was we said, well, what if we just created a very simple control plane? In fact, it's just a small piece of software that can be put right on the switch itself. So you don't need the server. Uh, and uh, you're able to basically simplify that switch into something that for all practical purposes, it just maps one port or multiple ports in to all of the ports out on all of the uh, access nodes that are connected to the switch. So it's a very simple device. Think of it as almost like a hardware VLAN kind of device, okay? And where we've targeted this is in that security camera access control, small cells, things like that. Where you don't likely want to use this is going to be in like high-end AV, where you, you know, you're thinking about things like multicast and you know all those other features that you definitely want to have a fully capable network. So that would be more of the SD LAN side of things. But if it's just I have 30 cameras that I need to hit on a campus, then this could be a really good solution. Or maybe it's a parking garage or parking lot where you know you've got some cameras and access control and things like that. So where it seems to be hitting extremely well is in higher ed, K through 12, 
large big box retail, parking garages, parking lots, things like that. Okay. And so what this is, is it's fiber power deep, like what we showed you on that layer one side, but it's got a lot of advantages. So it's a, uh, it's a very simple piece of software that's put in. Uh, you've got basically your cabling options with both uh, the indoor outdoor cable as well as the plenum rated cable. It can be upgradable to a full network. So if you think about it this way, if you if you were to have used like a media converter type solution, then you're kind of stuck with that. You'll never have full visibility to the edge of the network and have full control down to the port level and set security and Mac filters, you know, all those kinds of things you do from that perspective. You know, you, you not, won't necessarily be able to see what your POE negotiated and actual POE consumption would be. You know, all those kinds of things you would be, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to see or manage. Uh, with this solution, if you did want to upgrade it down the road, you're just adding that orchestration layer in. You're adding that server to the system, and now you've converted this entire platform from a, you know, almost like a media converter plus type of approach to a full-blown network. So what does this look like? Basically, you have that software-defined data plane with the transceiver that goes in there. Typically, it's the one gig transceiver and then that goes to the cch panel in this case it's an o4u and then you also have that power supply that's um, using the 57 volt dc 100 watt circuits that's coming on the other side that's then combined together into the actify cable where you then feed one of our access nodes so you can use any of the access nodes that we carry. There's a one port, three port, four port. There's the uh, five port, an eight port, et cetera, okay? So that's it. That's what these solutions look like, okay? No orchestration platform, no server for what we call touchless. So in the environment, for example, this is a maybe for a parking garage, you're still gonna have your controller and storage and you know whatever uh, whatever devices you need to run the service. That's gonna be plugged into the software defined data plane and then along with the power that's going to feed those devices at the edge so in this case it's like security cameras uh, there's a blue phone in there and things like that okay so what's this look like for uh for a security camera deployment you would have you know in this case where we have four security cameras plugged into an eight port ont we've got power from the ps psu6 and we've got our network coming from that software defined data plane. You're gonna have the security uh, service coming in and just not to go into too much detail, but you see kind of know how we would lay this one out. Typically port 48, we reserve for debug. Port 47 would be the input port for the service, in this case, security cameras. And then from port 46 back to port one is where you could then support uh, basically access nodes. Right, so you could have 46 access nodes with multiple ports at each access node feeding these cameras. So you can see it scales up to a pretty decent size. Okay, and then to do this though, what we're doing, because you don't have the orchestration platform, you're just taking a laptop and downloading a little bit of software right into the management port on the switch. And once it's set up, it, it will map that port 47 out to the ports on that access node for all access nodes on the system. So this is a really simple example. Uh, you don't need a networking degree. You don't need to have you know deep understanding of networking to deploy one of these systems. It really comes down to if you know which cables to plug into what ports. Uh, you know it can be set up very very straightforward. We do have some other options where we can you know increase the complexity a little bit or the capabilities. So instead of having just one service, here's an example where we have four different services going in at port 47, 46, 45, and 44. And then you can see basically they're mapped to those access nodes so that you know the first port is always, in this case, a small cell, the second port will be for Wi-Fi, third port will be for camera, fourth port for access control. And every access node on that system would have that same port mapping back to that switch. Okay, so you're able to support multiple uh, services off of this touchless design. 
So you, you power the thing up, you put the software in, and it basically the software is what does all the mapping. And then you just connect all the, the boxes when the server uh, fires up. It sends the right software to each access node, and the system just provisions itself. So we, we refer to this as a self-provisioning network. Okay. So any questions on both software-defined networking or our touchless networking? I'm just looking at time here. We're getting close to uh, to the time time limit. So, perfect. Has anyone um, anyone from the from the group got any any questions? You can pop them in the chat, or or feel free to come off of uh, mute and ask the guys. I'm I, gonna I, I will I, share the case study also, Mark, if you have a minute. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if if anyone uh, if we happen to run over and you have to drop off, that that's that's fine. Uh, like we said, we're recording it to uh, and and we'll it'll be available. If you have some questions and you have to drop and you want to put them in the put them in the chat, we'll we'll get the answers back to you. But feel free to to, to hang on and uh, and watch uh, watch the last few minutes. But uh, yeah, I'm, I I would like to see that, the case study. Okay. Well, thanks, Ron, uh, for the great presentation. Sure. Oh, by the way, you'll have to unpin me and then uh, pin Kerwood to, to be able to see his video. So hopefully you want, everyone can see my screen. Yeah, OK, perfect. Let me just put it in presentation mode. We have those super fast computers. So perfect. So those are the case studies, uh, just to go over some of the numbers that you saw from Ron earlier. So fairly simple when we go over the small office. So this is what uh, those case studies are based on basically customers, different uh, feedback we got from customers installations. So on a small office, let's say 3000 square feet, about 15 employees. Say right now for this small office, there was uh, three Cisco access point, six uh, security cameras, 15 voice over IP phones and 36 data drops. Okay, for, so that gives you an idea. So in terms of material, so we're comparing the fiber deep solution to tra the traditional so solution. So in terms of material here, there is a cost saving from 21 to 23,000. So there's about 11% cost saving. In terms of labor, since there is less cable basically to pull, less IDFs also, there's about a 31% cost saving. So in total, you're looking at about a 17% cost saving for a small office. And Mark, I can uh, share this also with you afterwards. Yeah, please, I was just thinking the same thing. Okay, in a medium office, just to give you an example in the medium office, so this is a brownfield uh, renovation. So it's not a brand new uh, greenfield office, about 50,000 square feet, 65 to 70 employees. And you can see all the applications that were uh, supported by the system. So you had different access cameras, sound masking, security cameras, uh, voice over IP, AP, uh, AV, printer stations, and everything. Okay, so there's a lot more applications here on this uh, medium office. And we can see here on the medium office, basically, this was a redundant system. So there's a pad A and pad B. So if any, any way, uh, pad A, there was a problem with the switch on pad A, then the pad B would take over. And here are the numbers, what it looks like in terms of material. So there is a cost saving in terms of the material. In terms of labor, that's where you see the bigger cost saving is in the labor. And the, the, the total, it gives you about a 34% cost saving. Okay. The large office, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me at any time. Large office, much bigger, 180,000 square feet, six floors, 800 employees. So same thing, lots of applications. This one also redundant system, pad A and pad B. 
So a lot more access points also in this one. And let's look at the cost saving here. In terms of material, there is a cost saving in terms of material, less IDF also. Labor costs, significant it's cost saving on the labor. So that's where this one represents about a 29% cost saving overall. The campus environment, so 14 building campus environment, also a redundant system for those campus environment. This is to support Wi-Fi, video, voice, and LAN and security, 2,000 drops. So those are the numbers. Okay, so material, big cost saving. In terms of labor, there is a significant uh, cost saving also, so total about 41% cost saving. And the last one is on the outdoor camera. That's where you'll see the biggest cost saving is on the outdoor camera with our touchless uh, solution. This one is for 48 outdoor cameras. We're looking at basically fiber deep versus uh, traditional. So the cost saving is basically on the fiber deep. We don't need any media converters. So that's what's expensive in the traditional one. It's you'll need a lot of media converters and that's what represents about the 50% cost saving. In terms of labor, the labor is pretty much similar when you're looking at outdoor cameras, but uh, you won't need any more of those uh, media converters. So those are the numbers. And Mark, if you want, I can uh, share this with you after the presentation, if you want to share it with the team. Yes, please. One other thing too, uh, I should point out, um, if you do a search, in fact, I can, I'll quick share my screen again if, uh, Sorry to make you guys pin and unpin, um, but if you just unpin Corwood and I'm talking, I think I may pop up for you. Uh, Crestron uh, is one of the OEMs that we bumped into quite a bit on the AV side. So, you know, we used them in our headquarters. We used them in, uh, um, let's see, Illich Holdings when we did their uh, their build out in Michigan. Uh, we we dropped quite a few of those same boxes as well. And it's to the point where they've, they've really taken notice and they really like the performance of the network. Now, we didn't even touch on that, but when you when you go point to point optical, uh, we measure latency in microseconds, not milliseconds. And some applications, especially AV, really enjoy that low latency. So Crestron, the, what I'm showing here is a uh, um, their website, not ours, but there's a coin optical communications um, white paper that they wrote on basically running their services um, using our network. So that's that's on their website, but feel free to check that out too. Uh, but for some applications like AV, going all optical to the edge is definitely a, uh, a step in the right direction for them, okay? I had one question, guys. Um, who are you finding in the organization is, is kind of the fastest to drink the Kool-Aid when you're having these discussions with team? Obviously, there's, there's there's gains for IT, um, but your your I think your your C level folks are probably also considering this. Where where, where are you finding kind of um, the the quickest to say, yeah, the, I think this is a good idea for us. Let's let's make that one. For for me, it has been at the C level for sure, and also the IT managers because uh, they will be the one actually uh, monitoring the network and handling the network. So for them, it's very un important for them to understand the new technology that we're going to give them and how it works and how much data they can pull out of it. So uh, IT managers, very, very important right. to talk to those guys. And that may actually be a good follow up to the orchestration platform is very powerful. Uh, and it's it's uh, one of those things that when people see it, they're like, wow, this makes a whole lot of sense. Because you go from, you know, command line interface and having to be a very technical person on the networking side to more of a graphical user interface. And it's if I had to describe it, it'd be kind of like Google Maps. So as you drill in on this one pane of glass, you see more detail. And, you know, you set up your services, you, you set up all your VLANs that are coming into the system, you know, all your trunks that are coming down from your router. Um, you know, how your taf traffic is tagged, all those kinds of things are set. You know, you set up your security, you know, if you're going to put in like MAC address filters and other things like that. Um, but it's a uh, it's a very straightforward deployment. So 
think about it as like maybe you have kind of back to that hotel because there's different networks in that one building uh so you'd have one uh maybe one template for a hotel room you would have another template for a point of sale maybe another template for back office you know those kinds of things so you're just going to take those devices those uh access nodes in the list and assign them to those templates and then all of those services and configurations get basically set up and pushed out to those devices so we're bringing up large buildings you know 500 room buildings in 15 minutes because uh, once that's all configed uh, basically what we have is a spreadsheet and each uh, access node has a, has a unique identifier that's loaded into the spreadsheet and everything's assigned inside of that it's pushed up into the system and everything's auto provisioned so it's a uh, it's definitely a big step towards just automation and having that high level view and really define your network from a business operational perspective down into the details so uh, that could be a whole nother process that we uh, take you guys through um, obviously not enough time here today to do that but no, it's I, I think that's a good idea though no. yeah anyone still on the call have any have any questions come up in the last couple minutes I'll, I'll kind of leave it up there, see if anyone grabs our attention. Okay, otherwise, guys, I really, uh, really appreciate um, Ron and Kerwood from, from Corning uh, for presenting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward personally to, to learning some more and, and uh, maybe getting you in front of some specific clients of ours. Uh, to those of you on the call, once again, thank you for your time. Uh, anything that, any questions that you've had, you have, feel free to reach out to, to the team at Verge, and, and we'll be happy to, uh, to to dig up the answers for you, or or set up some more time with the guys. Other than that, I, I, I apologize for us taking a bit longer, but I think it was valuable, and uh, I hope everyone in, has a great uh, finish to their week. Perfect. Thank,